Hello and welcome to season nine, episode two of the Virtual Coffee Podcast. We're grateful to be sponsored by Level Up Financial Planning, who understands the importance of finding balance between having an awesome life today and being confident and excited about your future possibilities. If you want to take your financial confidence to the next level, check out levelupfinancialplanning.com and you can get that link in our show notes. I'm Becca, and this is a podcast that features the members of the virtual coffee community, where we're an intimate group of people at all stages of our tech journey, and we're here on this podcast sharing our stories and what we've learned, and we're all here to share it with you. Here with me today is my co-host, Dan. Yo, what up, Beck? How's it going? Hey, it's fun. Fantastic. I feel like I need a, I feel like I need a spookier uh, welcome now that we're into, you know, Hectoberfest season. Yeah. Um, is Oktoberfest spooky? Maybe, maybe I should. Well, it's just in the spirit of, you know, Halloween and stuff, right? Mm, yes, yes. I guess maybe not. Hacktoberfest is really based on Oktoberfest, which is less spooky and more drunken. We should so maybe, be beer so that. Yes, like, out of like, out have, of steins. Yeah, we filled. I don't have a Need stein. To, do we need virtual I, coffee steins? Do we need to? <laughs> we pro- we probably do. Yeah, no, we, we probably virtual do. Virtual coffee beer. We have virtual uh, coffee oh, coffee. Now, now we need beer. So in uh, during Hacktoberfest, should we shift? We're not no longer virtual coffee. We're virtual beer. Uh, it's worth it's worth virtual considering. Drink. Virtual <laughs> calming drinks. <laughs> uh, virtual lederhosen. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so yes, today in today's episode, we are hanging out with uh, Jessica and Brian. And we're talking about, uh, you know, in our open source season, we're talking about a, a book about open source. It's called Working in Public, The Making of Maintenance and Open Source Software by Nadia Eggball. And we read it as a, uh, <laughs> as in our virtual coffee book club. Um, and it seemed really cool. And so they came to uh, kind of talk about that and what we, what we learned and some insights from the book. Yeah, it's like incredibly useful to read this book. Um, and you can still check out all of the links that we have in our discussions online. So I think that we do a pretty good overview in this episode of talking about the things that are covered, but there are many more in-depth discussions on our discussion board, which you'll find posted in the links. Um, and it's worth a, a read because I think that, you know, I have been doing open source contributions for the last couple of years and reading the book helped me to reframe my perspective and to consider the impact that I have as a contributor on open source and also realize as a maintainer, like, okay, so what are the things that I need to consider going forth? Um, so it's definitely worth a read, but this is a really great place to start. And we appreciate everybody here who is willing to listen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I um, as a confession, did not read the book before the podcast, um, but I have it on my list now to read. And uh, it was still, I found it a really good discussion um, and seems like some good insights there and, and some good talking points too for for kind of group discussion. So I would suggest anybody that is interested in open source, either as a contributor or a maintainer to check it out as I am going to check it out. 100%. I will, I will even uh, email somebody, not email, send somebody my copy with all of my notes. I'm like a big fan of writing in the book. So if you're interested in looking at all of my notes, let us know in the comments and I will send it to somebody so you can check out all of the things that I wrote in the book. Um, But today we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves with our names, where we're from and what we do in our random check-in question. And we very much hope that you do enjoy this episode. Today's question is, what is the last open source project you contributed to? My name is Becca. I am developer experience lead at OpenSauce. I'm from a small town in Ohio. And the last open source project I contributed to was either Virtual Coffee. We launched a new monthly challenge yesterday for Preptember. Uh, and I made a couple of edits to the monthly challenge page or to one of the open source repositories. So it would be docs, intro, guest book, all of those I am fr- frequently making updates to. So 
Um, nothing major, just some minor text changes, but that's where I was last. Uh, okay. My name is Dan. I live in Cleveland. I do web stuff all over the place. And the last open source contribution was actually on the next JS um, repo, but it was not code at all, right? So my, my open source contribution was like contributing to issues uh, and, and commenting on a pull request that one of the maintainers was making. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm counting that. I'm, we're, we're trying at Virtual Coffee to, to push the, the fact that like open source contributions don't have to be just code or whatever, don't even have to be pull requests. So that that was mine. And I was I was, I was proud of it. I got some input in and stuff. And, and uh, so yeah. Um, Brian, why don't you go ahead? Hi, uh, I'm Brian. I'm in a senior Elixir dev, uh, currently living in Indiana. Uh, and my latest open source contribution to something that wasn't like my own personal project was actually also documentation uh, in Elixir, the, the dominant web frameworks called Phoenix, and I updated some of their docs. Nice. All right, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, hi. Uh, so the last open source project I contributed to was uh, Josh's uh, Josh Goldberg's uh, Create TypeScript app because uh, he posted, I believe, a few weeks ago that he had opened some issues. And so I popped over to that repository and worked on one of the issues. All right. This is awesome. Um, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Real quick, Jessica, can you do the your name and, uh, you know, where, what you do and stuff too? Oh, sure. Yes. Hi, <laughs> I am Jessica Wilkins, and I work full time uh, with FreeCodeCamp, um, mainly with the curriculum development team. Uh, so exciting stuff coming in the next few months. Yeah, very excited. Um, and one of my other contributions, pretty recent, I think within the last month, was to one of the Free Code Camp repositories, and Jessica coached me through that. So shout out to Jessica for being awesome. Um, so today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So rather than an interview style podcast, since we're focusing on open source this season, we are going to be talking about one of the book club books that we just finished reading, which is called Working in Public by Nadia Eggball. I'm sorry if I uh, did not pronounce that correctly. And the subtitle there is The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. So Jessica is going to give us a little summary of what the book is about. Yeah, um, so uh, I thought this was a, a great book there, and it gave like great insights into kind of what maintainers have to deal with um, in terms of uh, building out open source projects and maintaining them. Uh, so the book kind of starts off with um, just a little bit of history of open source, and I think a lot of developers, particularly those that entered within the like past five or even ten years. Um, have mainly been used to like Git and GitHub, but there was a whole other history before that. And so it, and it was nice to see the book kind of open up with different open source, um, uh, you know, uh, services besides like GitHub and then also different uh, source control besides Git. Um, and so that was really nice to kind of get that history. Um, and then we kind of dive into the different challenges that maintainers have to face. Um, and particularly, there was a lot of interesting sections about maintainers that started off with like pet projects and then it kind of exploded and then the challenges that it faces and then uh, some maintainers walking away from those projects. Um, and, and then it also talks about the challenging aspects of how do you get paid with open source uh, projects. And so I think it's a, a very good read that everybody should kind of look into uh, it's a nice like behind the scenes look on like the challenges that maintainers have to go through. Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate that. And I let's start there with some of the challenges. I we're, we're probably not gonna review this book linear linearly <laughs> chronologically. I don't know uh, from chapter one to the end. What we're going to do is just probably skip around because that's where my brain is at this morning. But um, that idea of challenges because I I think that that was one of the things that was. Um, really kind of eye-opening for me. So I've contributed to open source for the last couple of years at Virtual Coffee. We always do a big Hacktoberfest thing. That's actually like one of the things that we talk about being like the birth of Virtual Coffee. The um, We'd been doing it for a while, but that's what really kind of solidified the organization as something, hey, let's like learn and grow together and do things. Um, and so I've always encouraged folks to get into open source. And one of the biggest challenges that I think the book talks about is not having repeat contributors and the amounts of energy 
that maintainers put into each of the contributors and how that how it's impacted when you don't have the continuous contributions. And so um, I'd like to kind of open up the the conversation there and see what your take is on um, people who are are jumping in and making contributions versus people who are continually contributing and how that impacts a project. And I'm going to send it over to Brian first for that one. Yeah, I've been kind of conflicted on this throughout reading the book. Uh, I was sort of gathering my thoughts on it this morning, and I've kind of come down on the side of, I w- while reading the book, I was pretty hard on casual contributors uh, in our discussions, uh, mostly because of having run open source projects in the past, small ones, where you do get these sort of drive-by contributions. And as a maintainer of a, a small project at the time, you feel this pressure to like, oh, someone's interested in my project. That's awesome. Um, I'll accept it no matter what. And I made mistakes doing it that way. Uh, looking back on it more, like I was really excited by those casual contributions at the time. Like, so I think it depends on the size of the project. On a, on a small project, those casual contributors are great. Like they're really motivating to keep you involved. And like someone is actually looking at this thing. Someone's actually using it. And someone actually cares. But for larger projects, which is what a lot of the book is focused on, they're talk- talking to maintainers of larger projects or maintainers of many, many projects. Uh, I do think that becomes a problem for them. Uh, one uh, maintainer specifically talked about it, just dreading opening up their GitHub notifications. There's so many of them. It is just a, a never ending battle that you're, you're never going to get on top of. So yeah, it really depends on the size of the project and where it is in its in its life cycle as to how helpful or how much of a hindrance those casual contributions can be. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Brian. I, I definitely appreciate that. And I think that you, it might've been one of your responses. We have the whole book club discussion on our GitHub discussion. So we'll make sure that we post that in the show notes. Uh, it said like, like so many things, it depends, right? You know, whether or not this is useful. And, you know, Jessica, I know that you do a lot of work, um, probably with casual contributors in the free code camp repositories. And these are a lot of folks who are getting their first contributions. And it kind of makes sense, I think, for folks getting their first contribution to just try and find whatever the, I don't know, low-hanging fruit, or there's probably a better term for it, to get started, to feel a little bit more comfortable before they can build those relationships. And so, um, you know, from your perspective as a maintainer, how do you think that the casual contributions impact your projects? And after reading the book, do you have any thoughts on how you'll approach your projects and casual contributions this year? Yeah, yeah. I, as I was reading it, because the book talked a lot about, like, sometimes maintainers were a little bit resentful of, like, casual contributions because they knew that they would make a couple of contributions and then they would just disappear. And, like, most people don't stick around long term and they're like, okay, I'm going to put all this effort into working with them for a short period and then they just bounce and then I'm stuck with all this extra work. Um, and so I, I, I can definitely see where a lot of maintainers are coming from, particularly from like larger projects there. Um, I, I still really enjoy helping new contributors on board to the project and learning how to work with Git and GitHub for the first time and getting those first few uh, contributions in. And I, I think I just go into it knowing like most people, they're not going to be around um, they have a very specific purpose. And the book kind of broke this up a little bit into like most casual contributors. They go into it knowing they're they're going into it for a specific reason, whether it's like Hacktoberfest or they're just learning for the first time and they want to play around with different open source projects. And then they move on for a variety of reasons. And the people that end up staying a little bit longer, they were, they went into that project knowing that they were going to contribute a little bit more. Um, and that's been my personal uh you know, story there too, where at certain projects that I stuck around with, particularly with Free Co Campus, because I was using it a lot, and then I started contributing more and more, and I went in with the intention of like I'm going to stick around, and I think that's most people's mentality. And so I I, I can kind of see where maintainers would would get a little frustrated, where they're just like, oh, I'm putting all this work in, and then you're just gonna bounce like a month later. 
uh, particularly with like Hacktoberfest, <laughs> which is coming up, uh, where you get this like huge flurry. I know that uh, with a few of our free Cokie app repositories, we're going to get a huge flurry of contributors uh, opening up issues um, and requesting new features. And the book talks about this too, where people will request new features, but then there's not ongoing support to maintain those new features. Um, and so there's there, there's that kind of balance where it's like, okay, it'd be cool to have this new feature, but we've got to like maintain it, not just you know, build it and then walk away from it. And so I liked how the book kind of dived into the ongoing maintenance and who's going to help, uh, especially loan contributors um, and developers on these projects, like who's going to help them maintain as the the project grows um, exponentially there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. Who is going to maintain this thing? And I think that's one of the biggest considerations to think about when you are developing features for something, right? Like people might ask for an amazing feature and like, yeah, that would rock, but who is going to maintain that? And so there's a lot of conversations I think that happen behind the scenes that you might not understand unless or until you maintain an open source repository and I'm going to toss it over to you, Dan. To, I know that like we do a lot of virtual coffee to try and help people um, with uh, first-time contributions and kind of progress from there. Do you want to talk about your perspective of kind of building that open source journey for our members? Yeah, it's it's a complicated thing, right? And and there's you know especially in regards in regards to you know casual contributors and what you know uh, versus contributors that contribute over time. Um, it, I, I'm usually not trying to build like in virtual coffee, right. In our, in our goals and everything like that, it, the, the idea of trying to get somebody that is going to contribute a lot is really nice. And like, I tried, you know, that'd be great. And I like very much try to encourage people to do that, but I am like, I'm happy when people can, can contribute once and get through it. And that's like, that's cool with me too. Right. Um, our, our big thing, especially with Hacktoberfest is to, um, break the seal, I guess, for people, right? It, it, like, it, you know, uh, is like to to get them over the hump of that first, like the first or second one, um, because it it can be so, um, you know, I don't know, daunting, right? Uh, to to con- try to contribute to open source, even if you are a, a, an experienced developer um, and know the code really well, and like you know, you could look at an issue and say, I know exactly how I'm going to fix that, and still like that there's there's so many there's so many like things that go into contributing open source if you haven't done it before um it can make it can it can put up some some internal walls right and so that's that's our that's our like goal with virtual coffee especially uh with hacktoberfest is um breaking down those those barriers for people and and helping people sort of hold their hands if they need it you know um and reduce reduce the barriers for getting your first steps into open source right and so with that in mind you know we don't like i don't get frustrated when people do make a contribution and then wander off you know uh in general um and i i think if somebody wants to knock out some small issue and then they do it and then they don't come back like that's fine because the issue is done <laughs> right for me you know um the but the, like that isn't to say that uh repeat contributors people have been around for a while people who know the project uh aren't like the, like the things that they can do are going to be more valuable right and so i'm not going to trust probably i'm not going to trust some like large change or a uh, a uh, change that you know changes that need some more thought you know um like sometimes we have issues that are very specific just do this one thing sometimes we have issues that are like improve this thing you know somehow right like you know and and those are the kind of things that like i'm, I'm gonna be much more um happy with one of our contributors that have been around for a while and, and know the project know um with virtual coffee like then there's there there's not just like the code that's involved but also you know our community and our you know i don't know our vibe <laughs> right uh you know so lots of the lots of the virtual coffee contributions end up being content you know and so that stuff needs to be uh in line so like io is one of our like largest contributors and um and she has just completed like a, a few one like very large re like reorganized all of our resources right because our resources were getting um but we had a good problem we had too many you know they weren't organized very well and all that stuff and so um, that's not the kind of thing that I would have just like thrown up an issue on and just hit yes to whoever 
random person, you know, uh, wanted to do it. Um, so, so yeah. Um, and, and I forget who mentioned this, but like with Hacktoberfest, you, if you participate in the like Hacktoberfest label and all that stuff, you will have a lot more random people. And like, so that's like a little bit more of that can be a problem in Hacktoberfest. Like I, I don't mind so much that, uh, they contribute and then leave, you know, but the, there are a lot of people who are just trying to like knock things out really quick, you know, and without a lot of thought, that kind of thing. Um, and so that can be a problem, you know? Um, so like, there's like one time contributors and there's casual, not trying very hard contributors. Right. And those, those can be different too, you know? So, um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of my thoughts on the matter. Yeah, for sure. I think that definitely makes sense. And that goes into the idea of like maintaining the project and the challenges that come along with that too. The spam that you get is that requires emotional energy or, or brain power at the very least. And that's something that she talks about in the book to um, overcome and to think about like, okay, I have to deal with this. And that takes away time from doing the things that that they want to be doing, like writing the code or, you know, creating the issues and, and that kind of thing. Um, Jessica, you mentioned the maintenance of open source software. So why don't we take the conversation in that direction? So what are some of the considerations for maintaining the software that they talk about in the book? Yeah, I think that a lot of it centered around just having enough people to maintain some of those larger features. And particularly, I, there was this reoccurring theme where like individual, uh, like smaller projects, they were all pet projects. And they started off as these like small little pet projects that a solo developer, or maybe a couple of developers worked on. And then it just kind of exploded in um, it was interesting to see how it just grew exponentially. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, how the heck do we maintain this thing? Because this was just my small little pet pro. Like they never thought it was going to grow past just a few people using it. And now tens of thousands of people are using this. And so they just get overwhelmed with like, okay, who's going to stick around and help me maintain this thing? Or, you know, I have a full-time job and I have to kind of maintain this thing. And and so uh, that the book kind of kept continuing to talk about those uh, issues there on just basically like time because, you know, one of the themes was like, you know, money and financial aspects because a lot of people are working on uh, open source projects, even through their company, uh, won't allocate a lot of like, dedicated time and i was in that situation where at my last company we had a few open source projects and there would be seasons where we would like go full force on these open source projects and add all these different features and then we get into maintenance mode and it would just kind of sit there for a little bit and even though we were paid to like you know work on those projects like when it got to like maintenance mode um it just sometimes just sat there for a while and like uh new features that we were supposed to implement kind of just went by the wayside because we were working on client projects. And so it's just like, it seems like a, a complicated issue that we're still trying to figure out. And I think the book does a good job of kind of seeing it from like different, uh, different angles there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There's so many different challenges that you don't think of. And <laughs> there are some stories about maintainers that are like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not maintaining this anymore. Like people will get mad at them, right? And that's, I talked to an open source maintainer last week or the week before, and they were reading me some of the mass messages that they get from users of the software. And these people are using it for free. And they were so mean. I don't understand why someone would be mean like that. And I do understand why some people were like, hey, I'm doing this for free. I don't care how many users I have. I'm done. Like, <laughs> see you later. You figure it out. And, that you know, that's one of the big things that we have to be able to address because we don't want to get to the point where, like, huge projects, suddenly nobody – ever like peace out uh i don't want to do this anymore right or like what just happened with terraform um hashi corp changed the license on it i we're going to talk about licenses later in the season um but there are like different things that can impact that and i think that if we're not looking into how do we support maintainers that we're going to see more of this stuff happen down the line especially as maintainers like age, age out i don't really know what the, the right term for that is there but like hey, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm retiring or whatever. And there's nobody there to to take the reins on that thing. Um, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on 
the section or well, it's not really a section. She talks about maintainers throughout the book and the how to support them or the challenges that they face that you'd like to share. This is one of those cases where like, I think it's, I've been doing this professionally for 16 years now. So I have some experience in the pre-Git and pre-GitHub world. Uh, and there was a quote near the end of the book that really jumped out to me. It was like, public does not imply particip participatory. And GitHub makes that really hard. Like, you can turn off a lot of features in GitHub, but you can't turn off all of them. You cannot turn off uh, accepting pull requests on your repo. Uh, so you, you, there's many people who would like, be happy to put their code out there for others to use it, but they are not looking to participate in a community with their project. And the the book brings up the the big example of that is the creator of Closure, um, Chinky, I believe is his name. I may have got that wrong, but the creator of Closure, like he's very much like this is my project. Um, there's a tight group of other people who are allowed to contribute to it, and he's not accepting anything from anybody else. He's not even going to look at it. And GitHub makes that really hard, whereas before it was kind of just the default. There were tools like SourceForge and other things that were mostly just an exercise in pain. Uh, there, there's a reason GitHub won. Uh, but just the idea that it's really hard to opt out and to protect your time. Because the as a maintainer of a larger project, the the bottleneck is going to be your time and how you allocate that. And is it going to be uh, participating in the community? Is it going to be onboarding more maintainers so that you're increasing the amount of maintainer time that's available? Uh, or is it just going to be, you know, this is my project, other people may choose to use it, uh, but I'm, I'm not looking for outside contributions? Yeah. And I, I wonder if um, the green squares is part of the problem here. <laughs> I know at open source, we always talk about like, it's more contributions are more than the green squares, right? Um, because people are always trying to, you know, feel, fill that GitHub chart with, hey, look, I have made different contributions to things because those are the contributions that like literally count, right? Having commits and PRs to things. Whereas, um, those other aspects of maintaining a project, maintaining the community, answering questions, writing issues, updating documentation, like all of those things are incredibly valuable and they take up tons of maintainer time, but they're not rewarded in the same way. And so maybe like reconsidering what counts as a contribution could help to take some pressure off of that. But I, I think, Brian, that's a really good point to bring up that not everybody wants to make this a community project. And it would be great to have some safeguards in place for folks who who don't want to. They just want to share their code and make that available online. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> but uh, but I, I thought one that kind of touched, that reminded me of like another aspect, uh, which I guess we'll get into the financial aspect later but like how some of these like developers like like evan Yu with view like he's one of the main you know like that's one of like the major libraries that the javascript community uses and like he's still like trying to get ongoing support and whatnot for his project especially like financially with the conversations around like patreon and stuff which is just crazy because it's like so many people use Vue and like he still has like a Patreon account and is like raising funds that way. And I'm just like, why? How did we get here? So that the, the I think the financial aspects of all of this are like complex <laughs> to say the least, where you have like people that have run literally like what well, I think in the book they said there was one guy that had like 1100 or supposedly like 1100 packages and libraries that uh, he was maintaining and he was still trying to figure out ways to like get funding for that, which is like insane to me. So it's just, yeah, it's crazy. I think that's such a huge challenge. I mean, I've heard nearly every maintainer talk about that. <laughs> like, there's an expectation that people can use your work for free, right? Um, and there's not that much that can that that's being done about that. So. I don't know, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that now because I think that, that it, this is a key part. Like 
um, both to uh, sustaining open source, but also to preventing burnout in maintainers. Because I, I think most of us know that if you're just volunteering for free over and over and over, um, that it can it can be really tough. And the one analogy that's used in the book, and what chapter is this? Chapter five is the one of the Christmas lights. Let me see if I can find that really quickly. Um, yeah, I, I actually like that one where she talks about how like, uh basically she's talking about like how our neighbors like want to put up their christmas lights because they want to do it it's it's not like they're doing it for everybody else and then but she says like you would never in the real life walk up to somebody's door and be like i want to see these christmas lights and decorations like no one would do well no same person would do that uh but then online we seem to like feel more comfortable demanding things and for free and and so I, I did really like that analogy where it's like people put up their christmas lights for them it makes them happy and they have their own set of decorations uh, but you would never just walk up to someone's door and be like hey i want to see this reindeer in this corner of your lawn and i want to see these lights and all of this other stuff uh, so but in software it seems to be just okay to demand certain features and and not really want to kind of like contribute or pay for that and so I, I i did really like that that analogy that she used uh, towards the end of the book there yeah and there's the other analogy um free as in beer brian do you want to talk about that because i know that you did comment on it yeah so there's there's a distinction between free as in beer as versus free as in speech and i've never liked the like the term free as in beer um but i did like um let me see if i could find my notes on it real quick the the concept of free as in puppy I, I thought that was a much better uh, analogy for maintainership. Like you're given this thing and you have to, it's awesome at first. Uh, everybody wants to come see it. Everybody wants to help you out. Um, but then, you know, the, the puppy grows up and it still needs lots of attention, but the rest of the community is not quite as interested in helping you out with, with your dog anymore. There's, there's more puppies somewhere else now. Uh, so I, I thought that was a, a much better analogy for maintainership than free as in beer has been over time. Yeah. And those are, those are both like, that's part of the challenge, right. Of, of maintainership and trying to support maintainers. Um, what are some of the ways that she talks about in the book about how we can support maintainers? Yeah. I, I think that she, she offers a few different like suggestions there in terms of like, um, I think she, she also commented about how GitHub, because I think Git, we've you know talked about how GitHub is by far <laughs> the market leader. I mean, there's others like Bitbucket and GitLab, but GitHub by far is still like the market leader in this. Um, but she talked about possibly getting, you know, if there was more support from GitHub and now there was like supposed to be a list of features that maintainers were asking for um, that would help them uh in, in helping maintain these uh you know uh, different open source repositories and kind of like the the push and pull from from github and how github even acknowledged like hey yeah we, we could do a little bit better in that area and kind of help you guys out um and so she did talk a little bit about that um and then also just like maintaining like the community size and in like we talked to her a little bit earlier about how like some contributors or some open source maintainers will be very selective um, and sometimes a little bit gatekeepy. Um, and we did talk about that in the, or they talked about that in the book um, as well. But maybe that is one of the solutions of just like onboarding a little bit slower without being too gatekeepy. And like, what is, you know, like what what's the line there? Um, and that maybe if we onboard a little bit slower and, and you, you know, people start off with maybe some smaller contributions and, and, slowly but surely are entered into more responsibility or um or maybe there's certain things that they like can't contribute to just yet um and just finding different ways to kind of a lot of this is what's centered around like onboarding i guess techniques and and kind of slowing up that uh instead of just having like everybody just contribute right away um which might work but there's that that delicate line where it's like you know, some people kind of take it too far and are a little bit too gatekeepy and it, it rubs people the wrong way where they're just like, I had a poor experience. Um, and so she does talk a little bit about that uh, in the middle of the book there. Yeah, Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just thoughts around the, the financial aspect, really. Like there's, uh, there's a 
dividing line where you know, if you're an individual maintainer and you're taking contributions, they say through Patreon or GitHub subscriptions, there's some threshold that needs to be crossed before that is even valuable to you at all. And it's not just coffee money or, or something like that. And getting a project large enough to actually be able to support you is pretty rare. Like Evan Yu, the creator of Yu, even his, um, I haven't looked at the numbers recently. I, he's not making a ton of money uh, through through Patreon for the project. So did you contrast that against accepting corporate con contributions? And that gets into a whole like tax situation where corporations are not going to want to support these individual contributors because basically you're in a contracting arrangement then. And a lot of these people don't want to, don't know how to uh, set up an LLC or something like that where you know, the company will feel more comfortable giving them money or setting up a foundation. The, the company will feel more comfortable setting up the money. They don't want the, the overhead and bureaucracy of, of doing that sort of thing when they're just trying to maintain some open source project. So there's this tug and there's this tension where like, depending on what your project is doing, you're more likely to be able to make some sort of living off it through corporate contributions than individual. Uh, but there's more overhead in getting set up to be able to do that. Point. You know, it's, it's always something to think about. And, and like, that's true, even if somehow you had no corporate contributions and all just individual contributor, uh, you know, financial contributors. Uh, it, it's just like you're it, in America. Anyway, you'll have to pay taxes if you're getting over some amount of money, you know? Um, and you know, like that idea. And I, I it made me want to, we don't really have time for me to just sit here and Google things right now, but it made me wonder if there's like what, what kind of support there is out there for like legal support for open source, you know, maintainers. Um, maybe there's, you know, cause like I have set up an LLC a couple of times and it's, I don't know, overall, it's not too hard, but it's still like something to think about. And then you have to do taxes and all that stuff. Right. And it is like, Brian, you're totally right. It's like, it, it can be complicated for sure. I think if you are planning on doing it for your, like to try to get to a point where you can make a living off of it, it's, it's just going to be worth it. And part of, you know, the deal, but like, even if you're making a couple, like a thousand dollars a month or something, which is not a living amount of money, but it is like that, I think is probably in America going to be over the threshold where the IRS is going to expect you to give them some of that <laughs> unfortunately um and and so yeah brian like, like that's a totally great point it's like the legal aspect of like uh of accepting contributions and how that works um i think would be a great mm, place for some you know some resources or somebody to like dive into that and maybe it already exists i haven't like i said I, I, that made me want to google it so i'm gonna do that after we're done here but um i think like raising that i like raising that thought is is really good and i hadn't really um I hadn't really considered that, like how much, because mostly because I am independent. So I already have my LLC. Like everything I do is just through my LLC already. And it's like, I did it a long time ago, so I don't think about it anymore. But yeah, if you haven't been down that road, totally like uh, another thing that is totally um, can seem scary and like, you don't know what to do. don't know where to go. don't know how to talk to you, all that stuff. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up because I think it's a really good one. So as we kind of close out this conversation, um, I, the last question, one of the last questions I asked in the book club was, how did you feel after finishing this? Were you optimistic, unsure, still pondering? And I know at least for me, like this is a lot of really great information about open source projects because I'm kind of limited to the ones that I've maintained, which have all been smaller projects. Uh, in my experience talking to maintainers, which I've talked to maintainers of, you know, like mid-size projects, but it was really enlightening to see and to really explore. I actually, the there were a couple questions where I'm like virtual coffee in a lot of ways is we, we've always based what we do on open source. Like we are inspired by the open source ecosystem and this is how we're trying to run our community as well. And so much of it just like clicked for me. I'm like, oh yes, I feel that pain point or like, oh, I'm not the only one that feels that, right? And so there was like, a, I felt like a sense of belonging a little bit more, I think after reading this, but also of understanding some of the underlying issues that a lot of folks are feeling. So I don't know that how I feel after reading, I guess I would feel uh, still pondering. That's not really a feeling, but that, <laughs> that, that's what I'm doing. That is the action that I continue to have is thinking through these things and and 
searching for answers because I think the book poses a lot of really great questions and there's still a ton of room to provide answers for this. So I would love to hear what you all have to say um, about about that. Yeah, I guess I will will jump in. Yeah, I, I think that like, I, I think we're moving in, in, in a healthier direction, but we still have a lot of things to, to, to figure out. And like, one of the interesting aspects of the book were talking about when people like walked away from their open source projects, or they just didn't want to maintain anymore. Like it, it brought up the uh, controversy with the left pad where it was only like 16 lines of code. And the guy's like, look, I'm done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. And like so many other projects like depended on that, where it just like broke the internet. And um, and so those, I think we are going to still have more of those aspects because especially with like NPM and how it's all structured where there's like packages on packages of packages where there might be some small little another left pad where somebody is just like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to walk away. And then how many other packages is that going to affect? Um, so I, I do think that's going to continue to happen. And I don't know if we have a solution for that. Um, and as if like in that left pad case, like basically someone else just jumped in and like recreated like their own version, but it's like, can we keep doing that? What if it's like something more complex and the book kind of talks a little bit about that, but I think overall we're moving a little bit more the healthier, uh, aspect. I, I think we should still have more like conversations within the software community in general about what we could do with open source, particularly with maintainers. And if we continue with this conversation and keep asking these types of questions, then we can hopefully get some some answers down the road there. Yeah, that's awesome. The left pad thing is very interesting. Um, I'd encourage you, if you don't know what that means, to go read the uh, read the story. It's it's very very fascinating. Um, Brian, any uh, final thoughts on that? Yeah, the I guess I'm still in the pondering camp. Of the the stuff that I hadn't considered coming into the book is sort of the social relationships around the ecosystem especially like parasocial relationships with social media where like I'm very familiar with parasocial relationships outside of the tech community and social media, but I hadn't actually considered it being part of this ecosystem as well. And stepping back, like I, I work in Elixir. There's a couple very well-known people that, you know, are extremely important in the community. And I would definitely qualify. I would consider my relationship with them. That's parasocial. I had never thought of it through that lens. So it's an interesting way uh, to think about it going forward. Really quick, define parasocial for people who are not me that might not know what it means. Sure. So parasocial relationships are basically one-sided relationships through social media where, for example, you follow someone on Twitter and you feel you know a lot about them. You feel that they're your friend, but... Uh, you are never going to have an actual interaction with them. Or if you do, it'll be a very brief interaction. Got it. So that's kind of like, is it the origin of that word kind of based on parasite? Is that what that is? I am not sure. <laughs> I have thought the same thing though. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I like that's a, it's, it's a really good point. And, and like, that is a good word. And we all, I think in this day and age are very familiar with that sort of relationship and have, you know, I'd certainly do, you know, um, a lot of people both in code and, and that stuff and the the idea of um an open source project having a, a social media you know presence um is always kind of interesting too it, it, that's a whole nother thing to manage if you're a maintainer you know I, I don't think uh i don't think i would suggest that for everybody or anything like that but um it definitely can be a way to get the word out and also maybe spread some awareness about um you know financial things or things like that um okay well everybody i I think we're going to wrap up i thank you both for coming today um i really appreciate it we're, we're going to be doing these every week for uh, september and october um so you know stay tuned and um yeah i think that's all we got so thanks jessica and brian and we will uh, see you guys next time bye everybody yeah thanks thank you so much for listening to this episode of the virtual coffee podcast this episode was produced by Dan Ott and Becca Harrell Weigel and edited by Ashley Mulder. If you have questions or comments, you can hit us up on Twitter at virtualcoffee.io or email us at podcast at virtualcoffee.io. You can find the show notes, sign up for the newsletter, buy some VC merch, and check out all of our other resources on our website, virtualcoffee.io. 
If you're interested in sponsoring Virtual Coffee, you can find out more information on our website at virtualcoffee.io slash sponsorship. Please subscribe to our podcast and be sure to leave us a review. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.